Good morning, Gulf Coast. How are y'all doing this morning? In case you didn't know, that was at Tri-State Christian Camp. Uh, Will and Eileen Pelt had a, um, did so much work to put that together. If you've never been to camp or never had the opportunity, I would suggest next year you, you find out when uh, we will be leading camp, and I would definitely suggest you try to go out there. It is the, the, uh, the most difficult uh, time that you will have, but it also is really, really one of the most rewarding times that you will have. Getting to spend uh, a week with the, the kids and, and just uh, being able to see them and, you know, out kind of outside their element and, and, and really diving into the Bible on, a, on an everyday basis is really, really cool. So if your kid had the opportunity to go, uh, make sure that you say thank you to uh, Will and Eileen. And, and they ended up with about 30 kids that ended up showing up. And, and just so you know how God works, uh, the week before, there were two kids signed up, and we were talking about not doing camp at all. So that's just how amazing our God is and, 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 and how he truly believes in us when, when we're truly faithful to him. Uh, but again, if you're a guest this morning, if you're with us on, on Facebook or, or watching us online, I just wanted to say uh, welcome, and, and I'm so glad you're here this morning. Uh, we're going to continue with our, our summer of Gulf Coast series, which is kind of like a, a, a mishmash of, of stories and heroes of the Bible. Um, so I hope y'all uh, are, are enjoying what's going on. I hope y'all enjoying your time here. And, and so this morning, I'm going to introduce you to an amazing woman from the Old Testament, maybe that we don't probably talk enough about, and, and maybe we don't really know much about at all, but really an inspiring story. So we're going to be in Judges 4 this morning is where we'll be. If you'd like to open your Bibles there, uh, you can follow along on the screens. Uh, we have Bibles out at the Next Step table. If you need a Bible, they're absolutely free, so, so make sure that you grab one. And, uh, and, and while you're getting ready for all that, I want to tell you about uh, an amazing woman that I know personally. I met my wife in, in, in college, um, around 92 uh, time frame. Um, and she just did, you know, she was an amazing, amazing woman. She saw uh, potential in me that, that I never saw um, in, in me. She helped me do things on my own that I would normally have let my mother do. Uh, that was kind of a, a painful uh, thing that we had to go through there for a minute because uh, mom took care of everything for me, and Carrie didn't necessarily want to do the same thing. So, but, but we got used to that, but she made me a better husband. She made me a better father. Uh, she made me a better Christian and, and just in generally made me a better person. Um, when we met and we started dating, I was working uh, part-time in a baseball card shop, which was at the time my absolute dream job. <laughs> no responsibility. I got to play with baseball cards and look at baseball cards every day. And, you know, not much going on, just hanging out, really. And uh, now to uh, 23 years at uh, ExxonMobil because I, I knew what it meant to support a wife and a, and a family. And she helped me through that. Um, and through all that, I became a deacon um, as well as an elder here at, at the very best church that I've ever been involved in. So, but today, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about a female hero, hero of the Bible, but we need to kind of set the stage and, and the circumstances for what's going on there. In the book of Judges, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud had died. So, in the book of Judges, what we see is so many times, so much uh, craziness go on. Do you remember what the definition, what we call kind of the definition of insanity is, is doing the same thing over and over again, right, and expecting a different result? Well, that's really what was going on with the Israelites in the book of Judges. So they would, they would, they would follow God, and everything would be great, and then they would decide to worship another God or, you know, kind of go off on their own thing, and, uh, and, and it was very, very bad for them. So they would kind of whine and cry out to God. And parents, you kind of get this, right? When like your kid is, uh, you know, wants to do things on their own and, and they don't want to ask for your help, right? And then 
And, and then eventually, you know, all they do is ask for your help. Mama, 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 daddy, daddy, daddy. I need, I need some kind of help. So that's, that's kind of what the Israelites were at, at, at this point in, in time and in, in history. They had developed <laughs> this back and forth relationship with God. And it was kind of like, you know, dealing with toddlers to a certain extent. So God would appoint a, a judge to rule over them. This really wasn't what God wanted to do. Obviously, he wanted the people to stay faithful to him, but God would appoint this judge over them because they, they needed somebody in charge. They, they, they wanted somebody there that would, that would lead over them. <clears throat> so they do this over and over and over again. And this time, at this time in chapter 4, they were being treated cruelly by the Canaanites who were led by King Jabin. And mostly his, his general, Sisera, was just, they had spent about 20 years uh, giving the Israelites uh, a hard time. So the people cried out again, and, and again God appointed a judge of their own people to lead them again. But this time it was a little bit different. Judges 4.4 4 says, Now Deborah... A prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. I want you to see kind of two things with that. So we, we, we meet our hero here, Deborah. And, and as we start talking about that, what I want you to see is, you know, it's kind of a name that we don't know that much about, right? So, so how many hero Deborahs do we know? Um, so it was hard for me to think of some. So I, I remember Debbie Reynolds, and, the, and she was an actress, but really the only reason that I remember her is because she was the mother of Princess Leia. Um, and there was Debbie Gibson, which that dates me a little bit, uh, musically, because uh, I don't know, if you're not probably my age or older, you probably don't remember who she was much either. Um, Debbie Swinford is, is a member here. Uh, let's see who else. I have an Aunt Debbie. Uh, Deborah Jo was her name, and probably the most famous Debbie of all time is Little Debbie. She's really my favorite Debbie. She makes amazing cookies and, and snacks and cream pies and, whew, this diet, you know, this diet is killing me because this, you know, this is my favorite, next to my wife, this is probably my favorite woman of all time. <laughs> but truly... The most famous Debbie of all time, or the most famous Deborah of all time, uh, we find in, in Judges 4.4. 4. Uh, I want you to notice two things about her and in, in, in what it says in, in, in those verses. Is that, number one, she was a judge. Number two, she was a prophet. So let me tell you how, how not necessarily strange, but how odd that was culturally at the time. Deborah is one of is one, the only one female judge out of the 15 that ruled. She is also one of five female prophets or prophetesses. That's kind of a hard word to say. So, so she was really breathing rarefied air no matter what side you look at. These were normally jobs that we see that were dominated by men. But obviously God saw something different about Deborah. God saw something amazing about Deborah. And Judges 4 5 says she would, used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for her judgment. So I want you to know how amazing that is. If you have something named after you, I think you've hit the big time, right? You, you have a tree that she sits under and she judges. So, you know, I was thinking we could do that outside with like Bill and, and Shannon and I, you know, on the palm trees out there. Maybe just a little plaque, nothing big. Doesn't have to be ostentatious or anything. I mean, just something small. You know, Palm of Scott. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. And you've made it through to something. You've, you, you've become amazing, right? The book, Deborah Anointing, by author Michelle McLean Walters, says it like this. It says, within Israel, the task of a judge was more than just determining legal cases. The judge was the leader of the people, the president, the king of the nation, a military and civil leader. It says when God raised up a person to be a leader of his people, that person became kind of the, a liberator and a deliverer, rescuing them from the oppressor. The judge had the responsibility to give wise counsel 
to God's rebellious peoples. So the judges were leaders. They were leaders of the people, and they got their hands dirty, and they gave motivational peace speeches, and they led the troops in the battle. These were powerful, powerful people. These were people that God wanted in place for a specific person to lead his people out of all the issues that they had kind of created for themselves. So let's move on to Judges 4, 6, and it says, She sent and summoned for, summoned for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. So Deborah calls to this leader of her armies, Barak. He's kind of the general over the Israelite army and the commander at the time which is un uncommon again, right? Because we have, we have a female leader and a female judge, you know, talking to and leading this male general. But what we see here in, in this relationship is we kind of read through, read between the lines, and you can read the rest of, of, of judges on your own, but there's no animosity, there's, there's no hesitation, and both kind of understood the roles that God had put them in. Deborah says, go get 10,000 men, get ready for battle, and God will lead us and we will win. So Deborah stands firm in, in her faith. So she says, we're going to go into battle. I want you to get 10,000 men. I don't want you to be ready. So as we read through chapter 4, it, uh, it mentions that Sisera had 900 chariots. But it also, historically, we know that he had about 20,000 men, too. So really, the odds are against Barak and are against Deborah. Because the, those, those chariots also had the charioteers, and they had an archer in there as well. So they would kind of round everybody up as they went into battle. We see them in the front lines a lot in movies, but they kind of went into battle kind of behind everybody and just kind of rounded up everybody that was running off so they could take out everybody. This was, a, this was an all-or-nothing thing that was going to happen. So mentioning those chariots and, and mentioning and, and knowing historically their men, they're really, really outnumbered. So we jump into, into 4.8, and it says, Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. So I think he understands and he sees what? The things really aren't in his favor. He understands that he's outnumbered, and he's concerned. And why does he need Deborah? Why do, th this is a man thing, right? This, this is war. He's getting ready to go to war. But this was what? This was no ordinary woman. This was no ordinary woman. This was a woman that was handpicked from God who probably looked a little like this. Does anybody remember Merida? One of the first, this fiery redhead who, who shoots a bow and arrow, and she wrestles bears, and she kicks bad guy butt. And she was really the first Disney princess that came along that, that wasn't a damsel in distress, that didn't need a man to rescue her. This was a leader. And this, I believe, is who Deborah was, too. This is the Deborah that we see in Judges. Why would Barak come to her? If you're going into battle, right, you need the best per people by your side every time. It doesn't matter if it's a man. It doesn't matter if it's a woman. It, it, it just does not matter. We need to fight and lead, just like Meredith did, just like Deborah would have. But we also, and probably more importantly, need is we need to be connected to God, just like Deborah had. You know, why do you think God puts his people sometimes in those situations? Anybody remember the story about Gideon and how many people he had to, had, had to fight? And he was allowed to take, what, 300? 300 people to battle a huge army. And he picked those guys by, what, how they, how they drank water. <laughs> you know, there was no military skill involved in that, but there was faith. And that's something that Barak was lacking in, but that's something that Deborah knew all about. Deborah says in verse 9, it says, and, and she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kedesh. What I want you to see in this is that the leader led by God is a leader that we should want to follow. Deborah says, I'll go. 
But since you put conditions on this, since you put conditions on this battle, the glory is not going to go to you. The glory is going to go to a woman. Deborah was the, the catalyst that, that spoke of God and moved the people into action. It's what great leaders do. They move people into action. She knew what kind of general Barak was, and Barak knew what kind of leader that she was. She motivated them, letting them know they could be victorious with God, and they both played their parts. They both did what God had given them and used the skills that God had given them. We see this in the best leaders, don't we? What we see in the best leaders is that they know when to listen and they know when to talk. So husbands, I wanna, I wanna tell you something huge this morning and listen close. The best way to lead your family is to not beat your chest and say, it's my way or it's no way. It's finding about the best plan, even if it's not yours. So I want you to be very, very quiet about this because I could, I could just see the headlines. Florida man says he's not always right. Or Florida man says his wife was correct. So, you know, don't let that get out too far anyway. It may be that our wives are the ones that write. And, and it may be that we just need to find the right decision, but it doesn't necessarily have to be ours. Barack, I believe, saw that. He knew that he needed Deborah's wisdom. He knew that he needed her because he knew that God was behind her. He knew that God had backed her up in all of this. Remember, a leader led by God is who we should want to be led by. Judges 4.14 says, And Deborah said to Barak, uh, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. Deborah says to Barak, you have this. This is yours. It's ready to go. And I want you to notice two things Barak did. With no hesitation on his part, he led his troops. He said charge. He said freedom. He said cream pies to the victors. And they routed Sisera's army. Again, with no disrespect to each other's role. They didn't try to do what the other person was good at. They just did and used what God had given and planned with him. The leadership and the victory in this battle came by God's direction through Deborah, with Barak, with God's, when, when God's people needed it the most. So, so Deborah gets the victory, right? She defeats Sisera. He, he leaps out of his chariot and runs and hides into, into a town that they had a treaty with. And a woman named Jael takes him in and feeds him and hides him and gives him something to drink and tucks him in at night. And that's where we think the story ends, right? But it, it gets a little weird here at this point. And so we see that in Judges 4.21 says, But Jael, the wife of Haber, took a, a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. I think we're all under the assumption that that's what was going to happen, right? After the tent peg incident. So we see that Deborah didn't even need to get the glory for this battle, to get the glory for this victory. But she said a woman would. She told Barak, because you doubted, you won't get the glory for this victory. And, and so this, this escalates kind of quickly, right? It's probably not the, the Bible bedtime story that we're going to be telling our kids at night. Oh, by the way, you know, big tent peg into the head. You know, you know, you know sleep well, Johnny. It'll be fine in the morning. Uh, what we learn from all this, the, the, the problem that, that we have in today's society is that we get caught up in the stereotypes we have placed on people. Don't get caught up in, in all that garbage and all that, you know, God can use anyone at any time. But if we're not careful, we can miss out on the whole point of what's happening here. I, I want to go back to, to Judges 4.14 again because I think it says something very important. And it says, and just read it with me again. It says, And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does the Lord not go out before you? So Barak 
went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. The whole story is about the Lord. The whole victory is because the Lord. The whole, everything about this story shows, shows the glory of God. Our stories should always be about his glory. We make it about so many other things, don't we? Uh, I, I'm the leader. No, no, I want to be the leader. I, I should get the credit. No, no, they should get the credit. I, do you remember in grade school, what was the, the greatest thing in the world was being first in line, right? That's what you wanted when you were going to take a bathroom break. You wanted to be the leader in the line. And that's how some of us are still like that today, aren't we? We still want to be the leader. We still don't understand that God should be getting all the credit for everything that we do, for every story that we have. God should be getting the credit for that story. And it feels like we're all, I mean, we're all very, very different. Men and women and all people, we were given many different abilities and, and passions and strength, and we can't all be good at the same things. But God has blessed us all how he sees fit. And I want you to know something important this morning. Before God called us different, he said that we were the same. I want to look at a passage in Genesis during the, the creation. <clears throat> and it's Genesis 1:26 through 27. And it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the, cre all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Two times he says in there that he created man, and he's talking about the human race overall. But before he said we were different, he said we're the same. We so much want to separate ourselves into gender and, and color and, and so many other things in today's society. But I want you to realize that God said that we're all, every one of us were made in his image. And we all have his backing. We follow his lead. We can do so much, so much together, so much more together than we can do alone. Barak understood that. He knew that he was better with Deborah's help. And I think Deborah probably understood that too because she didn't try to lead the army. She just motivated the army because she knew that he was the leader that she needed out front. Women, I want you to, to, to think about Deborah. I want, I, I want you to understand that Deborah says that you can be mothers, that you can be wives, that you can be homemakers, but you can also be an avenger. You can also be part of the Justice League. You can also be a hero. E e even all those things make you a hero, no matter what you decide that you want to do in life. Gulf Coast, I want to tell you something honestly, you, and you know this, is that you only follow leaders that are successful, don't you? For all of us here, we should only follow people who are going to take us where we want to go. Barack did. Deborah did. Deborah led the people of Israel into 20 years of peace. And, why, and who she followed was God. She got her direction from God. The question is, who are you really following? Does it lead you closer to God or does it lead you into, in, into some kind of crazy path of destruction and some crazy path of heartache and some crazy path of pain? Are we following God? Do we have kind of blinders on? Or are we going through the same thing that Israel went through so many times? You know, falling away, coming back, falling away, coming back. You know, set your eyes on God. Let God be that leader. Your takeaway today is very, very simple. And I want you to see, follow the leader. And we, we know who the leader is, don't we? It, it, it's simple. Don't look to any person because we fall and we, and we fail and we get messed up. Look to Christ. That is the example to live by. Jesus is the true, true leader. What he has done for us is it, so great. And despite the fact that we, that, that, that we sin over and over and over again, and, we, and, and we're the ones that, that, that spitted him at, on the cross, he gave up his life for us, and he begs us to follow him because his way is better. His way is better. 
this morning as you as we get ready for communion I want you to, to just take a few minutes I want you to take this opportunity to, to, to think about the memorial that Christ set up for us to, to remember how great a leader must be to sacrifice himself for us and one more time I want to ask you who are you following who is your leader pray with me please Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for heroes like Deborah, for people that we see that, that, that only had your best interest in mind, uh, a, a leader that we can look to follow, a leader that we can be, uh, that can be a great example for us. But Father, help us to keep ourselves focused on Christ. Help us to keep ourselves focused on his leadership. Father, help us to, to remember the sacrifice that he made for us. Father, we can't, uh, we can't say thank you enough for those things. Father, we just ask that you guide us, that we follow Jesus, that, we, that, we, that the Spirit move in us, that one day you can say, good and faithful servant. Father, as we commune with you this morning, as we take these emblems, Help us to remember what it really means to be a leader. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.